12, and tonight I'm talking about something that many people refer to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Some call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some call it the baptism with the Holy Spirit, some call it other things, but you may have heard some phrases if you've been around the church or Christianity for a while, you may have heard some phrases that have to do with um, the Holy Spirit dwelling in a person, empowering a person, changing a person, and you may have had some questions about what all that means. And so tonight I want to kind of demystify what, what that means, and I want to help you understand what it means to, to have the Spirit of the living God living inside of you, and what it means when the Bible says that, he, that, that you'll be baptized with him or in him, okay? Ephesians 5 verse 18 says this, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Okay, that's a big word that we don't use, you know, you probably didn't hear that, you know, this morning at the breakfast table, but debauchery means um, all kinds of wild living. It's, it's living that's out of control. And so debauchery would be things that are actually under the influence of something other than your right mind, okay? It leads to the wild living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so I want you to, I want you to, to, to underline that verse. I want you to remember that verse if you haven't heard it before. We're going to unpack that a little bit. But there's another verse I want to share with you as we get going from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And this is a verse that's been used by lots of people to, to um, describe um, what it means to be baptized uh, by the Spirit into the church. And so many people have said that the Holy, Holy Spirit of God baptizes you in the church and adds you to the church, and he's the agent that's actually baptizing. But I, I want to submit something to you tonight, and I want to submit something to your, your theology, your study of the Word of God, that... that this, this verse right here is specifically the only verse in the entire Bible where the Apostle Paul or any biblical writer even mentions something about the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Holy Spirit in a teaching kind of way. And I want to show you what it, what it says and what it means. For we were all baptized by, is what some translations say, and in every translation of the Bible, you'll have a little parentheses there with the letter A beside it or some type of footnote. And you click on that footnote or you look down in the, the, in the footnotes of, of your scripture, it's going to say, or, with, or in. And so the, the main, the, the most, I think the most accurate translation of this verse is we were all baptized in or with one spirit so as to form one body. I could go into all the reasons why, but I will give you a couple of them. One is just the word, just write them down, write down these two words, the word agent and the word element. The Holy Spirit is not the agent that's actually baptizing us. The Holy Spirit is the element that we're being baptized with or into. And so I, I want you to know this verse is actually talking about Jesus, the Lord Jesus, baptizing us in the Holy Spirit. And that process is what forms one body. All right? I know this is heavy up front, but we're going to get into it tonight. So as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And I want you to pay attention to this. This is very important for understanding what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 5. We're baptized in one spirit, and we're also given one spirit to drink, which means the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not designed to be one, a one-time incident that puts you in a celebration party in the end zone of life. It's designed to initially radically change your entire life in an overwhelming, drunkenness, plunging, submerging, drenched kind of way. And be there for all of your life for you to continually drink and be filled. So tonight I want to share a message with you called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. If you're taking notes, write that down. If you're not taking notes, write it down. This is a very important word. Come on, let's receive the word tonight. Father, we come into your presence tonight. We came to hear from you, not a man. And so we ask you to speak and um, teach us what it means. Teach us what you mean. And then, Lord, empower us to experience you as you designed us to experience you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you want to write down another phrase, go ahead and write this down. Language matters. Just write down the phrase, language matters. Terminology matters. 
I remember my grandpa was at my house. He's from Little Rock, Arkansas, and um, he liked to joke and kid around. He was an ABF truck driver um, all of his adult life, and he retired from ABF. That's Arkansas business something uh, trucks, and um, and he he just had a he had a joking kind of jovial type of of a mindset. And so when he was at our house, he was he was either very serious and quiet, or he was always cutting jokes. All right. And so he liked to get a kick out of playing tricks on words. And so one of his favorite things to do was to ask us in the morning while we're eating breakfast, hey, did you slumber while you slept? (laughs) We all had a grandpa who did something like that. Do you slumber when you sleep? And I'd always say, no, I don't slumber when I sleep. And he'd always say, well, then you didn't sleep. I'd go, yeah, I did. And he'd say, well, did you slumber when you slept? I said, no, I don't slumber when I sleep. He goes, well... I, I thought he was meant like I thought slumber meant slobber, but if I knew that slumber meant sleep, I'd have said, "Of course, I sleep when I sleep." Just playing a trick on words. Some of you have actually been played. You've been made to feel like you are missing something in the kingdom of God because you're not using the same language as other people use. And so, some people may have come to you and said, "This: Have you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit?" And you're a believer in Jesus. You're operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Your life has changed. You're in love with Jesus. You worship Him. You've even, some of you have even radically overcome the power of the enemy by the cross of Jesus and the Spirit of God. And the language where you baptized in the Spirit was used in a way. They were trying to actually find out if you were, had an experience with the Holy Spirit that was evidenced by speaking in tongues or some other type of miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so you were kind of, you're like, I, I, I mean, I have the Holy Spirit in me. And they say, no, but if you, did you like get the, did you like get the, the, the gift? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, did you like get it? And what they're trying to find out is, have you had a one-time experience in your life that so moved you to something supernatural that it was evidenced in a speaking in tongues is what they're looking for. Now, I want to remind you, next Sunday night, I'm preaching an entire message called How to Pray in the Spirit and what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit. And part of that includes what the Bible calls a prayer language. We're going to talk about that next week. Don't miss next Sunday. You're going to find out exactly what I believe and what Anchor, what the Bible teaches. Not what Anchor, but what the Bible teaches and says about about praying in the Spirit. And it's much more than just praying in tongues. Way much more. But that's a side note. Here's what I want to share with you about baptism in the Spirit. Three little topics here, and kind of write them down or take a picture. People at Anchor, like, there's so many words on the screen sometimes, people just snapshot the the screen. So, baptize was a, a marine term that meant to plunge or bury a submarine or a boat. It was a burial. It means to bury something underwater. And so the word baptism in scripture, it means to bury or to be plunged under, drenched, soaked, immersed into, or to sink under. Obviously, the spirit is not referring to a demonic spirit or any kind of spirit in general. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, and you're going to see a lot of verses that mention this tonight, is not talking about just any spirit. It's talking about God. It's personal. He is a person. The Holy Spirit's a person. He's referred to as a he. He can be grieved. He can be quenched. He can have a personal relationship with the Spirit. We'll talk about that in weeks ahead. So let's talk about the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And the meaning is to be completely enveloped and occupied in the personal reality of the Holy Spirit. No part of the life is untouched, body, soul, and spirit. Acts chapter 1 is one of the the few times that the Bible talks about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And here's what that's from Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself. And it says, after his suffering, he presented himself, that's Jesus, to them, that's the apostles, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. That's all the disciples, the, 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 the believers. And many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about nonsense. If Jesus came out of the grave and talks 
about anything. That means it's the most important thing on the planet and in the heavens. And he talked about the kingdom of God. I'm going to spend the entire month of September teaching what that means. And the Holy Spirit is the one who establishes the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven through us. We're going to talk about that in the month of September. But I want you to look at what it says next. On one occasion, this means on one of those 40 days that Jesus showed up and talked to people face to face after he was raised from the dead. On one of those days, the Bible says while he was come on, <laughs> he was eating with them. That just means we're going to get to eat in heaven. Somebody say hallelujah, man. Just say glory, adios, if you know some Spanish, all right. Mi espanol is apathetico, by the way. That's the only phrase I know in Spanish is glory, adios. All right, so while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised. Okay? This is... This is one of the, if not the only passage in the entire Bible that has the gift, the promise, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the same text, on the, in the same area, from the mouth of Jesus, linking them all to being the same exact thing. Okay? Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's a, it keeps on going. Peter replied, this is after the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the, the, 12, the apostles, and they began speaking in tongues, and Peter preached. At the end of his sermon, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, that's us, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. I've been teaching and preaching and doing ministry for almost 30 years, but I've been actually studying scripture in depth since I was about 14 years old. And when I was 14 years old, I did not believe accurately about the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit did some works in the first century and he stopped when the Bible was complete. That's called cessationism. That's what I believe, that the Holy Spirit ceased to operate on the earth. I literally broke up with, with very, very um, interesting girlfriends because they spoke in tongues. <laughs> I'm like, she's crazy. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I was scared of people who talk in a language they don't even understand. Are you with me? I was like, uh-uh, get away from me. You can scare me. I was, I was scared about the, I mean, anything called the Holy Ghost, I was like, I don't like ghosts. <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like ghosts. I don't get spirits. I don't get that whole, it's that, I didn't, I didn't get it. And then as I matured in my faith and studied scripture, I began to study even more. And I began to actually look at some other things that I was taught growing up and thought, well, that's not completely accurate. And that wasn't completely accurate. And then I began like having more experiences in my life. And I thought, my personal experience right now is not matching up with what I was taught. And probably since my sophomore year in college, I've been on a journey of discovering and learning more and more and more and more and more and more and more about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to have a lifestyle that drinks and is ongoingly pursuing being filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the things I've realized, and this is through a whole lot of study, and maybe we can do it. I'm not coming to you as an arrogant preacher that's got everything figured out. I'm a humble man just like you. I ate breakfast today. I ate lunch. I took a nap in my bed. I got ready for, for church just like you did. Okay, I, it's, I'm, I'm a normal human being, okay? And so if, you, if you're a person that thinks, well, Pastor Jeff, I've always been taught. Well, I just want to submit to you that, that I've said those words before too. <laughs> I've said those words before too. On both sides. Because some people are thinking the baptism in the Holy Spirit, man, that's like, that's like different than just receiving salvation. Because like I received salvation, I didn't feel anything. But whenever I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I felt boy, everything. Well, there's been many times in my life where I felt nothing, and the more mature I got, and the more understanding I got, many encounters that were even more than when I would, I would, I, I argued from 2000, about 1 to 2008, that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at an event where somebody laid hands on me, 
and I chose to lay down in the front row and like literally lay down and pray for the next 30 or 45 minutes and had an encounter with God, I'll let you know that 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 was a significant shift in my maturity of faith, but I've had many encounters even more supernatural and powerful than that one. So I would not call that, I would call these ongoing fillings, renewals, encounters with the Holy Spirit. But I I, I want to encourage you in your study and in your journey to understand that these are the descriptive terms that are used for the same exact thing in the Bible. Clothed in power. And and there's some times where you're actually going to experience this as we start talking about gifts where you, you literally are... You're, you're, you're covered with some with power from God different than what you have on an ordinary day. And I'm going to explain that more in just a moment. The Holy Spirit will come on you or come upon you. The Holy Spirit fell upon the people in Samaria and did not fall upon others who had believed. And the Holy Spirit didn't come upon them yet until later. And then you baptized in the Spirit, received the gift, received the promise, received the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit. Do you slumber when you sleep? Yeah, you slumber when you sleep. Do you understand sleep? Can anybody articulate sleep? Can anybody even tell when you go to sleep or when you're out of sleep? I, I, I love sleep. Like, I love to fall asleep, but I I never know when I'm about to fall asleep. I just know how to get in the position to sleep. Are y'all with me? And then after I've slept, sometimes I can take a 15-minute nap, and it feels like I slept for 45, four hours. Like, I I can't understand sleep. But I can tell you this. Tonight, you're going to see what the baptism in the Holy Spirit does. And tonight, I'm going to share it with you in the most clear way I possibly can. This has been a long intro, but the rest of it's fun. And you will not forget it. Are y'all with me? All right, so here it is. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number one, it changes your talk. It changes your talk. Now, I thought about having the band come up here on the platform and play every song they know about tequila, but I thought that would be too distracting. So I just brought a bottle of tequila. It's a real bottle of tequila. I had to borrow it from a neighbor, and I won't mention their name. I told Sarah, hey, call them and see if they have any kind of tequila, bourbon, something like that. If you struggle with alcoholism... This is going to be helpful for you even tonight to understand this. And I'm not joking or minimizing controlled substances changing a person's life. So please don't email me or text me and say that was inconsiderate, you know, uh, to do that. Because it's not. I'm giving you a literal illustration that if you drink this whole bottle, it's going to change you. you straight up going to talk different. I promise you. They say, like, based on body weight, that if you take, if like, Two, like you weigh 125 pounds, 140 pounds as a female, and you drink two to three shots, which are two ounces, little little drinks, that you're going to start to get buzzed. And your talk is immediately going to slur. Your eyes are going to change. Your emotions are going to change. Your feelings are going to change. But what I want you to understand is that you are entering a different state of mind the moment you start to drink. It is the same exact way with the Holy Spirit. Paul says, do not get drunk on, come on, some of y'all are like technical people. Y'all are like, he said wine. He didn't say nothing about Schlitz Smart Liquor. He, he didn't say nothing about a tall Bud Light. He ain't said nothing about tequila. He just said wine. I don't even like wine. Thank God he didn't say wine. He's talking about it all. He's talking about, don't get drunk and let something besides Jesus control your state of being. Instead, get filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when you, when you, when you, when I, I, I want to go, go back to the slide with the little state there on it. I'm not ready for that verse yet. When, when I talk about state, mode, and filters, I automatically, I'm just going to make a noise. And when I say this phrase, it has the power to change at least two people in this room. And I want you to listen. I'm not even, I didn't tell them this. I didn't prepare them for this. But I'm going to make these sounds. And it is going to change their state of mind. Are y'all ready for this? Are you ready to hear it? Because when I make the noise, they're going to finish the next part. Are y'all ready? (laughs) Only my LSU fans understand that. (laughs) 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 (laughs)
And when you enter the atmosphere and the music starts to go, it changes whatever your fight song is. It changes your state of mind. It changes your mode. And when you hear another, I could not stand. Come on, if you're a Florida Gator, it's not great to be a Florida Gator. We lost 31 to nothing there, playing there in 1993. It was, no, it was like 31 to 7. And the whole student section is right behind the offensive line. Now, I, I wasn't a starter as a freshman, so I stood on the sideline in a game the whole time except for one extra point conversion. I went out on the field. I stood on the sideline the whole game, and the entire time I hear people who've been drinking a lot of that <laughs> right behind me saying things like this, hey, 53, when are you going to play? You're not even good enough to play on a team that st stinks. And just in my ear, and I just hear this, great, to be a Florida Gator is great. No, it's not. Get me out of this atmosphere. I'm not drinking any of this. I don't want a sip of the Gators. I don't want a sip of anything, and I'm tuned out. Some of y'all are like that at church. Holy Spirit, lift your hands and worship. No, 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 no. Some of y'all were like that. But I'm telling you tonight, don't get drunk on wine. Look at the verse. Don't dr get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And then he tells us right here. He tells us what happens when a person is filled with the Spirit. The first thing that changes is their mouth. Their language changes. The accent of heaven begins to permeate their lips. It's one of the most significant things about when the Holy Spirit fell, a fulfillment of Joel 2, they started to speak in tongues. And people understood it. The very first thing that changed in the human experience was the mouth. Besides the, the spirit and the soul and the body, all that salvation part. But the first thing that changed was their, their speech. Paul says that when you speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you that when you begin to drink, your speech changes. Boudreaux was driving home from a bar one night. The cop pulled him over. I debated whether to tell y'all this, so y'all got to laugh extra loud, okay, because I'm, I'm uncomfortable telling it to you. But Boudreaux was driving home from a bar one night, and the police officer pulled him over, walked up to the window and said, hey, uh, sir, you got a license? He said, yeah, hold on. He found his license. Registration? Yeah. You know why I pulled you over, huh? No. He goes, you been drinking? He goes, oh, yeah, I've been drinking since about 4.30 this afternoon, yeah. He goes, well, the reason I'm pulling you over is because I believe your wife fell out of the car about a mile back. And Boudreaux goes, thank God. The cop said, sir, that's very insensitive. He goes, no, man, I thought for a minute there she'd gone deaf. Y'all are not laughing. That... All kinds of things run through your mind when you're drunk. For some of us, it's just you get drunk on TikTok, you get drunk on YouTube, you get drunk on videos, you get drunk on food, you get drunk on sugar, you get drunk on gossip, you get drunk on bad news, you get drunk on media, you get drunk on politics. Why? Because you're drinking that, and whatever you drink changes your state of mind. It alters your mood. It puts you under the influence and all kinds of things go through your mind. And you don't even know if she fell out or if she's asleep. You, your judgment is impaired because of what you're drinking. In Acts chapter 2, it shows us what literally changed the speech of the church was their devotion. Come on, take a picture of this or write it down. It's one of the most popular verses in regards to community and groups and life change. And it says this, they, it's talking about the people who were spirit-filled, the ones who were baptized in the spirit, the ones who were saved at Pentecost, the 3,000 new believers. It says they devoted themselves, which means they committed their heart, their time, and their input. I'm just telling y'all right now, it is hard to be a teenager today. Amen? Some of y'all are like, you don't even know how hard it is for you, all right? But it, it gets harder as things get 
what? It's, things are not going to be the same. We're, we're not going to probably, we're never going back to a time where these don't exist. I mean, by the time some of our teenagers, kids are teenagers, there's going to be robots in their house. And they got robots going around and robots coming downstairs and getting their food for them and flying up. And if, we, if the Lord tarries that long, it's not going to get less complicated in this world. It's going to become more and more and more and more essential that the church learn to drink of the Holy Spirit and be primarily devoted to the influence of the Word of God and drink of Him and be filled with Him and not be intoxicated with a screen and not be intoxicated with other things. But it says this, they're devoted to the apostles' teachings. Okay, and what that's talking about is your input. They're devoted. They, they have a devotion. The first thing that changed in spirit-filled believers was what they allowed to be put in them. And so they said, we, we, we don't want to hear anything if it's not from Jesus. We don't want to hear the report of Caesar. I don't want to hear the report of the government. I don't want to hear the report of the military officials. I don't want to hear the report of those enslaved with fear. Give me Jesus through the teaching of the word or the apostles. And it says next that they were devoted to fellowship. That's literally their focus. I can't wait to be with the other believers. Why? Because they've all been drinking. They've all been drinking of the Spirit. And when everyone comes into the room prepared with expectations, the atmosphere is different. It doesn't matter what song is played, the room is ready to encounter the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because they've come in drinking. They've come in filled. They've come in devoted. There's a fellowship. What does that word mean? It means koinonia. It's the Greek word. And koinonia means to have something in common. And what more do we have in common than the Spirit of God that makes us all one body and empowers us all to drink from one spirit? And man, when we come in together, devoted to the Word, drinking from one spirit, and it says to the breaking of bread, that's, that's communion. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I, I catch flack sometimes about having communion available every single week, and people are like, eh, we need to do it once a month. Really? <laughs> Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 says, On the first day of the week when they came together to break bread, they didn't come together for a band. They for sure did not come together for a sermon. They didn't come together for lights or a show. They came together to remember Jesus. It's a memory thing. And the last thing Jesus said on the night he was crucified before he dismissed his disciples was, Take, this is my body eat, take, this is my blood, drink, do this in remembrance of me, and may I always be in your memory. And so the body of Christ was devoted to the word, they were devoted to fellowship, breaking of bread, and that's communion, and to prayer. I'm going to spend the entire sermon next week teaching on pray, praying in the Holy Spirit, what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit. It's one of the ways that the, that the Lord effectively keeps you. The way he, eff he effectively keeps you saved is by giving you the ability to pray in the Holy Spirit. It keeps you focused. It keeps you in alignment with his word. And that's one of the ways he keeps you. And I want to teach you what that means next week. And then he says this, everyone was filled with awe. <laughs> I had a promise. A church that's in awe of Jesus doesn't drop its jaw at the world. A church in awe of the power of God doesn't drop its jaw at the world. But they weren't just in awe of God. They were in awe at the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And maybe you're a person who believes in Jesus that, be that believes that all of the miraculous signs and wonders were just the apostles in the first century and they don't happen now. Would you be open to believing, pursuing that God may want to do signs and wonders through you? Like how much do I have to drink to be able to do that? Not a lot. The Holy Spirit of God will use anybody you're like, I just came out of sin. Perfect. You know you're a sinner. You're qualified to be used. Point number two is this. It changes your walk. 
you know what a sobriety test is. It's where they line you up. I mean, it's hard. It's, it's hard, man. There was a, uh, I got to tell you all another Boudreaux joke. You're going to love this one, all right? So if you don't, you laugh anyway, all right? So there was a uh, Boudreaux and his friend Thibodeau were driving down the, the highway, and they, uh, they, they saw this, this car pulled over, and so they slowed way down. And the car was a cousin. And the cousin got pulled over, and the cousin was a juggler. And the cop pulled him over and asked him, say, sir, you know, you're, you're, you're driving, or you're, you're swerving all over the place. You're drunk? He goes, no, nah, I'm, a, I'm a juggler. He goes, you a juggler? He goes, yeah. And this cop had already seen all these knives and swords in the back of his car. And he says, what are all these knives and swords back there? He goes, I'm a juggler. Yeah. He goes, no, you're not. So he gets out of the car, and he starts juggling these knives and swords and throwing them up in the air and catching them. And Boudreaux and Thibodeau just eased by. And Thibodeau goes, Boudreaux, we in trouble. He said, why? He goes, that DUI test is getting harder and harder, man. <laughs> Nobody's going to pass that. Thank you all for laughing. All right, so the, the, the sobriety test, I mean, they make you, like, stick your arms out, look up at the sky. Like, I can't even do that sober. Are you all with me? <laughs> Passing a DUI test means can you walk under control? Or do you stumble when you walk? Are you, and what this is talking about is your character and your community. It's talking about whether or not your character, number one, is who you are. Come on in private. Go ahead and go. Who you are when no one can see and when all can see. And I just want to ask you, not in a, not in a demeaning way or an embarrassing way. I just want to ask you, and I want to ask me, I want to ask us, in the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, are are we the same in private as we are in public? Are we the same around our church friends as we are around our buddies or our girls or my peeps? Be careful who you call my peeps. That has to do with your community. And here's what it says. All the believers, verse 44 in Acts chapter 2, all the believers were together. Every time you see the word together, just say it out loud, real loud, right? All the believers were together. And had everything in common. Who are your peeps? Are, 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 are your peeps drinking the same thing you want to be drinking? Or do you get filled at church and then get drained when you're around their peeps because they're drunk on something else. And they want to talk about something else. And they don't want to talk about this because they weren't in this room. So they didn't encounter this message. And you may say, hey, listen, I, before we meet again, you got to listen to Pastor Jeff's message because, listen, I, I don't know, but I, I love you. I like you. I love being around you. But, like, every time we talk, can we talk about something other than what's intoxicating you? What's draining you? What's getting you down? What's making you feel hopeless? What's making you think the way it's all over? Gloom, despair, and hee-haw, agony on me. Deep, dark depression and excessive misery. Like, is there, is there something else? Like, I just want to challenge you. You can get filled and filled and filled, but the moment you get around your peeps and they drain you, you might need to consider who your peeps are. And that's the power of community. That's the power of a group. That's the power of coming in as a group. That we come in as a group of people that are sharpening each other and encouraging each other. And I, I want to challenge you. Like intercession must be a part of your life and your group this fall. Our world is dark. I don't like that we, ta we tactically and frankly practically lost a war in Afghanistan after 20 years. I, I, can, get, I, can, I can get so boiling mad. And you can show me facts from all sides, and it's still, and if I drink that long enough, you're not going to like me as a pastor. You're just not. You're not. You're not going to want to hear me preach because I got salt water coming out one side of my mouth and the Holy Spirit coming out of the other. Be careful who you agree with. Be careful who you drink with. Be careful who are your peeps. It says this, that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Come on, here comes together. Every day they continued to meet. Every day. Every day. Every day. One of the ways you drink of the Holy Spirit is being around other people who drink more than you. <laughs> and it says, every day they continue to meet together. In the temple courts, that was in public. 
who are public with their faith. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is public. The Holy Spirit is designed to change you publicly and privately. They broke bread. That's, that's eating in the home. Broke bread in their homes privately and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. I could spend literally six entire weeks preaching on that one phrase, the favor of all the people. And I'm just going to submit to you that when you pray, powerful things happen. But when you pray with two or three, heaven changes. When you pray with the entire room, there is a different level of anointing that happens corporately when the favor of God is demonstrated through spirit-filled believers. It changes the room. The Holy Spirit is literally looking for a church to manifest healing in. And people come every single week needing healing, keep on popping pills, and never call the elders to anoint them with oil, pray with them, or never bring it up to the group. But many of you do. What if we become a group of people that understands that there's way more favor when we come together filled? And the Holy Spirit doesn't just want to come upon you and fill you one time. That night you were tearful and shaking and crying. But he wants to fill you over and over and over and over and over. The church, a community baptized in the Spirit. Let me show you what the church is. Because some of y'all are like... What is the church? Is it like a building? No, it's not. It's not a building. The church is the called out ones, is what the word means, ecclesia, the called out ones. And it means people called out of sin, out of selfishness, out of an egotistic life, darkness and every dead thing, and into. The church is a group of people called out and called into, called out and called into, into a life together with other believers, completely plunged under, drenched, soaked, and saturated in the Holy Spirit of God, and fully empowered to do the work of Jesus by the very Spirit of God. And that is what establishes the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Many of you have actually seen, you've seen this this picture on our website, you may have seen it on graphics, but we use that that word kind of you and I, it's kind of a play on letters there with community. But what, what, when we say community, what we're talking about is people coming together in what's known as discipleship in the Bible. And discipleship means students. And some of our groups are what we call, well, what you may be familiar with as Sunday school groups or groups that are like your, your, your Sunday school classes that you went to where people are studying the Bible and someone's teaching. We call those equip groups. An equip group is, is where we have a teacher that's approved by Anchor to teach on a subject Robert Bray has taught several equipped groups on the Holy Spirit. Andrew Gwynn has taught several equipped groups on finances and financial freedom, financial peace. Steve Heyman and Angela Heyman have taught many times on. And so there's, these are teaching equipped classes, but most of our groups are what we call community groups. And they're groups where someone facilitates discussion, and there's eating, and there's prayer, and there's fellowship. When you go through a hard time, that group is there for you. When you lose a loved one, that group is there for you. When you're in the hospital, that group is there for you. You get COVID, it's impossible to get COVID if you're in a community and a group of people not find out. But if you're not in a community, if you're not in a group, it's really, really hard for the church to know that you're struggling. And so we actually encourage everyone tonight, listen, pray about this. Pray about how the Lord is leading you to be involved in community and a part of together with a group of believers this fall, all right? Point number three is this, it changes your world. It changes your world. Some of the most tragic stories that all of us hear is when people have a little bit too much of this and they come into a collision with another human being and it effectively changes the entire world with a drunken collision. The Holy Spirit of God is designed to so affect your life that every single day you live with the power to come in collision with your world and change despair, change hopelessness, change, change all of the things that are broken and literally bring about the Lord's presence on earth exactly as it is in heaven. You're like, ah, oh, it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. That's why we're spending the next several weeks talking about the spiritual gifts, power, and your impact. 
The Holy Spirit is not here interested in the patting you on the back to go do what you're talented in. Hey, you're a good communicator. Why don't you just start talking? Hey, you're a good administrator. Why don't you start like, like help, helping out with administration? Ah, oh, you, you got a positive attitude. Why don't you just be an encourager? That's not how spiritual gifts are. Spiritual gifts are designed, you're going to see, designed when God sees a problem on the earth or a person who needs courage or a person who needs hope, they're not leaving the message. These are group leaders. Come on, put your hands together for group leaders going out to get ready to be with you. When people began to get filled with the Holy Spirit, and there's lots of encounters, but as people get more and more filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what the Bible says. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You have no idea what people in your school, what people in your classrooms, what people on your campus, you have no idea what they're going through. You're like, my life's hard. Your life's hard. You have Jesus. <laughs> you have church family. You have spirit-filled parents. Your life's hard. I've heard many times from different leaders. I don't know how people without Jesus go through stuff like this. It's hard to go through pain, but it's really hard to go through pain without hope. And you are that answer that brings hope to darkness. The Holy Spirit, what changes in your world? The Holy Spirit fills you with joy. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The Holy Spirit fills you with joy in your devotions. Joy is the currency of the Holy Spirit. In my opinion, it's the number one sign of a person full of the Holy Spirit. Joy. It's, the, the, there's several scriptures, that actually verses that say that we're filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. That we're filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. It's like the same thing. When a person is full of the Holy Spirit, they get faith, they can, they get joy unspeakable. You know what joy is? Joy is the state of being that will not be moved by any bad news in front of you. Immovable. I praise God. Why do you know that? Because the Bible says that Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he had it, his eyes fixed for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. Which means there's a picture in front of Jesus that literally filled him with joy all the way through the Roman cross. How do you do that? You got your eyes fixed on the other side of the cross. You get your eyes. That's why Pastor Jeff always says best ahead. I tag it on all the phrases and things. You're like, Pastor Jeff, you say best ahead, but it's getting worse. Best ahead, it's getting worse. What's getting worse? Jesus promised in this world you'll have troubles, but take heart of overcome the world. How did Jesus have joy going to the cross? How did he do that? Because his eyes were fixed on you. That's how. His eyes shifted to how he can make a difference rather than why I'm a victim. It shifted to how I can change my world, how I can become an agent of change. And and I'm just telling you right now, Jesus said, do not you dare go out and try to change your world until you've been clothed with power from on high, until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. He falls on you. He comes upon you. He baptizes. You're baptized in him. You're saturated in him. Just do do not. And when they did, the world began to change. So here's two questions in closing tonight. Two questions in closing is this. Have you received the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Have you received it? And you're like, I don't know if I've received it. Are you saved? Are you saved? Do you really believe in Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your heart to him? Do, do you, do you, do you, are you walking forward in relationship with him? If the answer to that question is yes, you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want to I I encourage you. You have received the Holy Spirit. And to many of my people, they would call them charismatic friends. So I want to let you know. You say the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a supernatural encounter where things change. You're right. But can I, can I suggest to you to not limit the baptism of the Holy Spirit to that one time first instance and to realize that the Holy Spirit desires to continually fill you in greater and greater and greater measure. 
to all of my friends who grew up like me, maybe in a Baptist denomination or Presbyterian or Methodist or Catholic or something else, and you're like, ah, all that baptism in the Holy Spirit, drunk in the Spirit, tequila, all that stuff bothers me. Well, I understand. I understand. And you say, listen, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was saved. May I suggest to you that he wants to give you greater and greater and greater encounters with him and do not limit what he wants to do through you. Do not put him in a box. Do not quench his work. Don't do that. Can we come together and say, Holy Spirit, fill me and have your way with me. Would you stand right there where you are? Just stand right where you are. Just stand right there. And I want you to just to bow your heads.